mistaken. How many people in here think they recognize the two? Awesome. Esther, what did you think of one of One other thing I wanted to mention, I, I was here on uh, at the church, uh, well, I was here a couple of days this, this week, but one day when I was here, uh, I wanted to mention that Art, uh, Art Rice was, was here, and there was a big, big load of, of new dirt uh, dumped at the front of the, of the, cemetery, at the cemetery, ordered by the cemetery committee, so we knew it was coming, and we just didn't know if it was going to be placed there. But anyway, Art got his front loader. And he, he, he uh, went, I don't know how many trips he, he made with the front end loader, and he filled in all the, all the holes and all the low spots in the, in the cemetery. So if you'll see all the, a lot of brown spots there now, but he, he's going to uh, put grass seed in there too, so we'll have a nice grass again. So Art doesn't get a lot of recognition, but he does a, a lot of good work for us. So let's remember that if you're talking to Art, give him a call and, and just say thanks. I already did, but it'll be nice to come for you. Well, let us begin our worship service this morning as we say together, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, sheep of his pasture, give thanks to him, and praise his name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, When Morning Gilds the Sky. <laughs>
Father, we thank you that we have come once again to this place where we gather to worship. We know, Lord, that we should be worshiping you every day when we're on our own. But it's so much better to be together collectively, to share our hearts with each other and with you. And so this morning, O oh God, we come before you with praise and thanks. You brought us so far, so well, so good. We thank you, Lord. We, we don't deserve your mercy. When we think of, of so many others around our world who are suffering today, oh God, we thank you for the safety and security that we enjoy here. But Lord, this morning we pray for, for the dear folks who have had to leave their homes that we can't even imagine what it would be like to be told we had to leave. So the folks of, of Yellowknife and other communities in the Northwest Territories, the community of Kelowna in British Columbia, Lord, we pray for those dear folks today. May you bless them. And, and we, Lord, we think of all of those who just simply cannot be evacuated. We don't even know what's happening to them. We're thankful that you do. We think of the folks in, in nursing homes. We think of those in, in hospitals. And, and we, don't, we don't even know what to, what to say. We feel so helpless. The Lord, our hearts go out to all of those dear folks and to all of those who are risking their very lives to stay behind and look after them. Lord, we pray that you will intercede there. You will, you will send the rains, that you will extinguish the fires. But Lord, that you will never extinguish the fire in our hearts that, that lights our darkness and makes us wake up and be thankful and be prayerful and be worshipful. Lord, we pray for the rest of the world as well. We think of the, the, the folks who are still suffering in the Ukraine. It seems like that will never be, <clears throat> never be ending. And, and we, we think what it must have been like for our, our parents, our grandparents, our, our great-grandparents who went through the, the two wars and that raged on and on and on for years. How must they have felt? We now get a little bit of an inkling of what it was like for them. And so, Lord, you brought us to this point in our lives. You've, you've carried us through. You've blessed us abundantly. But now, oh Lord, you are waking us up to what's going on around us. We see the world still living in a fantasy land, in a, in a fairy land. Talking about things that just don't matter at all. Things of this world. But Lord, we thank you that you have set our hearts and our minds on eternity. Your word tells us that you have placed eternity in the hearts of men. Your word tells us that there is no excuse because you have revealed yourself to the whole world in nature around us. And so, Lord, we pray for those whom we meet every day, friends, family, strangers, Lord, we pray you would help each one of us to carry the light of Christ, the light of hope and love with us every day as we mingle with the world. And Lord, while we're doing that, we pray you'll help us not to be uh, isolated, but to be insulated, to be right out there where, where Jesus was, touching people that others would not go near. It's hard for us. We're not used to it. But Lord, you're, you're teaching us that as, as old as we are, we still have much, much to learn. So we thank you, oh God. This morning we, we bring before you the, the members of our dear church family here at Union. We know that there are some who are laid aside continually. 
And Lord, we know that those who, there are those who have been discouraged over the years and they need to hear from you. And so, Lord, we pray, you will speak to them and let them know that we are still here. The doors of, our, of the church are open, obviously, but the doors of our hearts are open. We thank you, Lord, that one day, one day in that place we call heaven, there will be a grand reunion when we will be together. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim, as the hymn says, in the light of the glory and the grace of our Lord Jesus. And now, Father, as your family, we pray the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, there are more of us here today. Turn around, wave, say hi. God bless you all. song, but I'd like to sing this. I think you do too. And we need to sing it today. It's the theme of our of our service today. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. I'm going to sit down. You can stand up or sit down, whatever you like to do. Clap your hands, whatever. Let's sing it together. <laughs> I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy.
you, I wasn't looking at you. were smiling. Now the rest of you have to too. smile too. Let's sing the last part. Ready? And I'm so happy. So Oh, 
will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, for I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken, contrite heart of God you will not despise. Thanks be to the Word of God. This as our means for today. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Our hymn before the sermon is uh, number 425 in the Red Book. This, is, this uh, tune comes us from the, the Maori people of the, of the South Pacific, I think. And uh, the words are, are beautiful, and it, they're very, very personal as well. So let's sing it together prayerfully. Let's stand if you wish to sing it. Rome? Have you ever been to Rome? Yes, many times. 
Uh, have you been to, seen the maritime prison? The maritime prison where Paul was, a, was in prison before he died? You've seen it, yeah. And, and, and incredible. Inc anyway, I'll tell you all about it one day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, the whole story of the Apostle Paul is very sad. And uh, last week we looked at Psalm 22. And uh, that was also very, very sad. Psalm 22, if you were here, uh, or if you watched it on the video, you'll know that it was one of the, uh, one of the uh, 15 messianic psalms of the Old Testament. There are 150 psalms, and uh, 15 of them are messianic. In other words, psalms that were prophetic about the future, and specifically about the time when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come to planet Earth. We also saw that even though King David of Israel definitely wrote Psalm 22 about a thousand years before Jesus was born, the psalm is really all about Jesus. It's amazing, incredible. It has little or nothing at all to do about David. And that, of course, makes Psalm 22 one of the most outstanding and, uh, and important parts of the Bible. Today, however, uh, as we look at Psalm 51, there, there is no question at all. It's all about the one who wrote it. It's all about David, King David, and no one else. The response of reading this morning, Psalm 32, was also written by King David, and it was written probably about the same time as Psalm 51 was written, and for the same reason. David had fallen into grievous sin. Uh, Adultery, lying, conspiracy to commit murder. And, and it happened. A totally innocent man named Uriah was killed at David's command. David thought that as king, he was above the law. No one could touch him. No one would ever dare to expose him. But he was wrong. It's interesting that when David's best and faithful friend, Jonathan, was killed in battle. It's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 1 that David said, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. In the same chapter, the death in battle of John's, Jonathan's father, King Saul, is also recorded. And even though King Saul hated David with a passion, without cause, and tried on more than one occasion to have him killed. David also included Saul in that sad lament along with Jonathan. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. This says so much about the character of David, doesn't it? He had a heart for God. He also had a heart for people. And even though he turned out to be far from perfect, far, far, from perfect. In 1 Samuel 13, the writer speaks to wicked King Saul and says, But now your kingdom, Saul, will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. And Samuel was speaking about David. So God himself says, David is a man after God's own heart. Further, in Psalm 89, verse 20, the writer says, I have found, it's a messianic psalm too, he said, I have found David my servant. And so centuries later, the Apostle Paul puts these two scriptures together and he says, uh, uh, he says, in Acts chapter 13, he says, After removing Saul, God made David their king. God testified. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God said that. Wouldn't you like God to say that about you? I sure like to hear him say about me. A man, a woman after my own heart who will do everything I want him to do. Wow. That is the, the, the definition of a servant. So, it's complicated. David was complicated. 
We are complicated. David's heart was good most of the time. But his life and his actions sometimes definitely were not. And to be honest, and I have to be honest, that sounds a lot like me. And I expect that maybe it sounds like you too. I don't know. The saintly apostle Paul, the man who wrote half the New Testament, wrote this to his young friend Timothy. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. <laughs> wow. To put that in writing for the whole world, then and down through the ages. Paul, the great apostle Paul, the one who's revered, revered has, has churches and buildings and stuff named after him. The apostle Paul, the worst of sinners, that's what he said of himself. It's no wonder that same Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. That's what love does. It keeps no record of wrongs. And so, I don't know about you, but I hope no one's writing down all the bad stuff I've done in my life. I hope not. I hope they're never going to bring it up. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So, Paul, Paul was, was, was hoping that, that folks would remember the good stuff. And, and, we, and we have. Now, be honest. Uh, uh, we, all, we all need to be honest. Um, and, and King David was honest. He was found out. He was fallen. He was, but he was repentant. He was sorry. And he was forgiven. And he did keep a record. He did keep a record, his own personal record, of all the bad stuff. And he recorded it, as we read in our responsive reading today, in Psalm 32, and in Psalm 51, our sermon text. That phrase from 2 Samuel, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. It's become a common saying in our world today. Why is that? Well, David certainly was, was a mighty man in every sense of the word. And he fell. But what, why is it that, that in our world today, we, we sort of get a, a kick a big kick out of seeing someone get brought down. It's true. Let's face it. We're all the same. How many times have I said, how many times have you said, it's about time you got what was coming to him? Huh? Huh? Right? Or words to that effect. Let's face it. Right now, I guess maybe most of the world who have the internet, half of our American neighbors are waiting to see how long it's going to take to see the end of former President Trump's political career. And the other half of Americans are waiting to see current President Biden brought down or fall down. And in the religious world, which for all of Christians is much closer to home, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, it's almost 40 years ago, we all still wince back in the 1980s when a prominent TV evangelist stood before his own church cameras <clears throat> and said with tears streaming down his face, I have sinned. Do you remember that? I have sinned. Another TV, TV evangelist with a, a daily show watched by millions, creator of a so-called Christian Disneyland, attended by thousands of they thought they were timeshare owners. He was indicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Wow. Thankfully, I think he only served seven. Like I said, we all winced. 
But shortly after that, just, just a few years later, still in the 80s, we all cried. I, I know I certainly did. I still do. When a fabulously talented American gospel singer lost her marriage and most of her career through adultery. And then just a few years ago, the fall from grace, horrible fall from grace, sexual sin, and it was discovered just after he died from cancer. He was perhaps one of the most gifted of all modern-day Christian apologists, a man who for years marvelously defended the gospel on university campuses around the world. What a tragedy. He was so respected, so renowned, I guess almost worshipped. In my library, I have books by him, and I have a multitude of wonderful quotes and illustrations that I really can no longer use. In spite of the fact that most of you, if I were to give you his name, you probably have never heard of him. But he sure made the headlines. But King David, the Bible reveals the truth about him. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, the truth will always come out. Eventually, it always does. All down through history. But the Bible never tried to hide it, unlike some modern-day uh, famous people who try to sweep it under the carpet. The Bible never does. The very worst that David ever did is all out there, and, and in confession mode, in writing by David himself. The good, the bad, the ugly. This, so as I said, the Bible doesn't hide it, but in case you don't know the rest of the story of David, and I think maybe some of you don't, you, you know, we all know that as a teenager, you know, he, he killed the giant, Goliath, right, with a slingshot. We all know that. And we all know, of course, that David probably, as an old man, is the one who wrote the 23rd Psalm. We all know that about David. But here's a review I was going to say some of the highlights is really some of the lowlights in the life of David. David was a lousy father. Can't preach about David on Father's Day. He was a lousy father. He gave all of his attention to his job as king. He obviously didn't have much time for raising his children. He left that up to his wives. <laughs> that was another problem. He had several wives, all at once. But if you look at his family, after all his children had become adults, we would say, too late, David. Too late. Too late. In 2 Samuel 13, we read that David's eldest son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar. His father, David, does nothing. Then in revenge, Tamar's full brother, Absalom, kills Amnon in revenge and then runs away and David does nothing. In 2 Samuel 14, Absalom returns to Jerusalem and he's shunned by his father, David, for two years. For two years. They lived in the same place, a big palace, mind you. But David never spoke to his son for two years. There was no communication at all between father and son. Then in 2 Samuel 15, in revenge, and you can probably understand a little of how Absalom felt, by this time he hates his father, he raises an army, seizes the throne from his father, King David. And then this time David runs away. <laughs> you can't blame him. It's either a case of run or be killed by his own son. Then in 2 Samuel 16 and 17, Ahithophel, who is David's former chief counsel, defects to Absalom, deserts David after serving him for years. Then in 2 Samuel 18 and 19, Absalom is murdered by Joab, David's own commander-in-chief of the army. And David mourns for Absalom. 
natural, and what Father would want. Now David is finally broken. 2 Samuel 18 says, The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. You can't get much more graphic than that, can you? A broken heart. But why had all this happened? It's recorded in 2 Samuel 13 through 19. Why? Why had David's family and friends and colleagues all lost respect for him? Why? Well, we go back to the reason why David wrote Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. One day, when David was in his 50s, his army was out fighting yet another war, but David stayed home in his comfortable palace in Jerusalem. I, I guess he had sort of retired. The story of David and Bathsheba, as told in 2 Samuel 11, is sad and very disturbing and tragic. And I know you've probably all heard it before. It's a pretty famous story. They even made a movie about it years ago. So I'm not going to go into detail about it today. It's nasty. I've already mentioned this morning that a totally innocent man named Uriah was killed at David's command. That was Bathsheba's husband. David assumed that no one would ever dare to expose him, but a prophet named Nathan did. And speaking for God, you can almost see him, he points his probably bony arthritic finger at David and says, you are the man. It's not in the Bible. You can imagine Nathan saying, David, Uriah the soldier was a better man dead drunk than you, King David, were cold sober. And it would be true. Okay, enough. Enough, enough of that. <laughs> what does all that history mean to you and to me this morning? There, there is one statement in Psalm 51. Actually, it's a plea. And it means the most to me. David says to God, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I, I remember, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate, I guess, most people, or a lot of people, don't remember the exact time, when, place, where, <laughs> manner, how, they actually spoke to God and asked Jesus to come into their life and their heart for the first time. For me, I remember it very well. I was 15, it was on May the 21st, <laughs> 1963, 60 years ago, good grief. And, uh, I had been going to a, to a church, you know, saying saying nothing, just saying nothing. But then the next Sunday when I when I went, I guess people saw that there was a change in Brian in his face, and and someone actually asked me to to stand up and you know back then they asked the young people to you know to what's been going on in your life, and so I did. I stood up and and I told the people what happened, and you should have seen their faces. They just lit up. And so many of them came up to me afterward and in the, in the subsequent weeks and said, said, it's so wonderful to see someone who's really joyful about being a Christian. <laughs> because down through the years, the joy can go, right? The joy can go. Bad things happen. Prayers aren't answered. Tragedies occur. And you're filled with questions of why or why me. And it's easy. It's easy to lose our joy. Boy, can you think of anyone who, who was more miserable than King David was? And so we pled with God, please restore 
the joy of your salvation. Yeah, the joy when I was back there as a kid in the in in, in the in the pastures, looking after the sheep and you know fighting off the wolves with my slingshot and looking up at the stars and then looking up at the sky and and just carefree and knowing that you were there with me and I want to be like that again. <laughs> That's what he prayed. I, I want that too, don't you? I want that too. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. So that's what David asked God. But he did it after admitting to all his darkest secrets and putting it in writing for all to see. And by the way, not only for all to see, but for all to hear. Remember, don't forget, the Psalms are actually songs, which everyone heard and remembered, and even some of the folks would sing them. So the words would never be forgotten. That's why we still got them today, all these years later. Now, 30 centuries later, 30 centuries later, we all know all the bad stuff about King David. But, but, we also know the end of his story. He was forgiven. God forgave him. God forgave him. And, and can you imagine how relieved he must have felt? In Psalm 32, remember he said, when I, when I hid my sin, it, all, my, all my bones were, were aching. Couldn't sleep. Life was miserable. But when he confessed it, he got right with God. The burden was gone. There was no more hiding. No more hiding. There's no more pretending. Finally, he was free. He was free. And I believe the same thing can hold true for us. Getting right with God. Being honest and open. Getting right with God. Brings freedom and peace and joy. I want that so much. Don't you? Freedom, peace, joy. I like, like David. The joy comes by knowing, and here's the word, which we don't say often, but it's a biblical word. The joy comes by knowing we are saved. Now, that isn't my word. It's not my idea. Jesus said it. John chapter 10. Listen to this. Jesus said, we can miss this, but here it is. I am the gate, he said. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He said it. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. What do you mean by that? What did he mean? I think he says, he's saying this, come to me, follow me as your shepherd, and I'll save you, and I'll take care of you forever. Wow. <laughs> Salvation means knowing God in a personal way, being assured of his presence with you, Believing that no matter what happens to you, God is going to work it out. He's going to bring you through it. He's going to give you the strength you need to face absolutely anything. And having accepted that, having believed that, having held on to that, well, that's got to give you a wonderful God confidence, doesn't it? God confidence. And friends, that's a whole lot better than self-confidence. Amen? Amen? God bless you. I hope today and in the weeks to come, we will all find, as Paul put it, the joy and the peace that passes all understanding. I've got the joy, 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 joy. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart. Amen. Let's uh, receive our offering and keep the gospel being preached in this place.
whenever your people come together to worship your son. We know it gives you great joy when you see your people serve you and serve others and, and give sacrificially. It gives us great joy to know that you gave sacrificially, ultimately, for us. You gave us your very son. You gave us yourself. You gave us hope and life. And yes, Lord, you've given us joy. So to this morning, we joyfully give to you. And we pray, Father, you'll bless what we've given and use it for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. There's one time that it's okay, it's okay to say, why me? And that's when we think about God's grace. Why me? I don't know. I'm so thankful. Let's sing it together. I know not why such wondrous grace. <laughs>